The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 14 of the Cinematography Podcast. I'm Ben Rock. And I'm Ilya Friedman. There's a mistake in our VO leading into this, because it says we're uh, recording in Hollywood, California, and actually we are now recording these at your newer, uh, more improved showroom in Burbank, California. That's correct. Even though it says Hollywood, well, you know, we're still in the greater Hollywood area, but we're in Burbank, home of Warner Brothers and home of uh, Disney and all kinds of other fantastic studio home of the album cover of pink floyd wish you were here shot on the warner lot true story i found it once the former home of jay leno and bob hope and a whole bunch of other people too bob hope you had to bring it down didn't you <laughs> hey there's an airport name after him here <laughs> didn't think i was bringing it down but, uh, you know. <laughs> well i wanted to talk to you a little bit about the possibly hipster resurgence of uh shooting on film i uh last week went and saw dunkirk and in IMAX at Universal City Walk, which I don't recommend to anyone for any reason unless you're going there to see an IMAX movie. But at Universal City Walk, they've got one of the better IMAX theaters in the LA Metroplex. Agreed. And uh, that movie was shot, about 70% of it was shot in IMAX, except for the like 30% that was shot in 70 millimeters. So it's big format porn. Uh, there are all these scenes, uh, you know, where the where the planes are flying way over the, over the ocean and you can like... F- in the giant wide IMAX shots, see the beautiful ripples of the ocean in ways that I imagine if I took state of the art, I don't know, Alexa or red, I don't know, Megatron. I don't know what the name of the brain is. 65. Yeah. No matter what the digital camera is, I don't think that you would get the look that they got out of that movie. And it's, pretty astonishing but actually as you said to me more people are talking about the cinematography about that movie than literally any other aspect of the film that doesn't happen with movies very often but yeah with dunkirk in particular at least in my sort of little technical spheres of uh you know friends and facebook and stuff yeah. like that dorks dorks yeah, is dorks. What yeah. huge huge discussions yeah. about people like where should i go see dunkirk should i see it in IMAX or should absolutely you should see it in millimeter IMAX. or should I see it in you know laser digital it's I mean I will say if you have the wherewithal to see it in IMAX you should see it in IMAX like I I'm sure it's a fine movie if you just went to your local multiplex and saw it digitally projected in 4k or something but I it it was a case study in what IMAX does that nothing else does I'm yet to see it in IMAX, so yes. I'll have to... Uh... But like you said, like I do think that the cinematography of the film kind of overshadows the rest of the film, but I actually think that that has more to do with the writing, and I think it's an intentional thing in that he's trying to put you in a war and make you feel kind of the sc- the scope of the war, but also kind of the <laughs> hopelessness and and everything that, that these characters are going through, but not re- you're not really given one character to kind of hitch onto and, and ride through the whole movie. There isn't a hero of, the, of Dunkirk. I've heard it described as Christopher Nolan channeling Terrence Malick, but is that a fair criticism or is it not? Really? I, I, I mean, I wouldn't say so because it's not as dreamy. Like Terrence Malick movies feel like memories. Mm. And Dunkirk feels like a movie. It yeah. just It's just not a linear plot line in the way that you're used to seeing a linear plot line. It's not even uh, temporally like all in order. Like, And it doesn't announce at you what, that it's cutting up the order that things happen in. It's just kind of giving you a few things out of, out of chronological order, mm. which is interesting. Very um, popular these days. Arrival did a lot of that. Other yeah. things have done it too, where they don't give you big signposts that say, hey, look, flashback, or hey, look, flash forward or yeah hey. hey, and i think it's fair i mean audiences are more sophisticated now so they're used to that kind of a thing one of our clients an asc cinematographer I, I saw him right after he'd seen dunkirk and he said well actually i heard it i heard dunkirk <laughs> and i thought that yeah. was, that was you know everyone i've talked to who's seen it said it's very loud very it's very loud. loud well and in imax too you feel like you're just gonna get knocked i mean even the yeah. trailers in imax i felt like i was getting you know yeah, you, punched in the face yeah you feel like you're you know your heart shaking in your chest from i i don't mind that but i think it's interesting because there's kind of like a retro hipsterness to shooting on film oh that, absolutely uh i was at the holly shorts film festival last week and i went to the whole kodak shot on film section where it was nothing but shorts shot on film and they brought out a panel of uh filmmakers literally filmmakers people yeah. who were shooting film 
And uh, we'll have a report and a clip from our new uh, field correspondent, Lindsay Loon, who goes out and covers and talks. That's so fancy that we have that. We have a field correspondent. I mean, who would have thunk? Yeah. uh, Anyway, uh, I was there and there was a couple of really interesting moments. And I'm uh, paraphrasing here. But one of these filmmakers said that for her, shooting on film was like she never wanted to do anything else because she found it was so much easier to get people to work on her production because she was interesting. Cool. But I, I thought, you know, going back and, and, in time and remembering what it was like when that was the way that you made a film, uh, I always found that people were more excited when you were shooting on a good format of film. Like if you were shooting a short on 35, people would be like, Oh yeah, I want to be in this one. It's being shot on 35. Well, they were having that same experience now with, 16 and there was even super eight there was some super eight love going on they they touted and brought out the new kodak super eight camera and i love super eight i always will i i think so too but i'm not wild about the new slogan for uh super eight oh no what is it which they 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 have uh the new slogan is this it's super is better than perfect which is a dig at digital because I think a lot of people are like, you know, always say that digital is like it's yeah. perfect, but super is better than perfect. Yeah. I don't know about that. That's a, that's well, I remember like two years ago, a friend of mine, uh, Zubi Mohammed, uh, sent me this, uh, link to this guy. I want to say he was in Sweden or something who had invented a $5,000. I shouldn't say invented. He'd engineered a $5,000 super eight camera with pin registration and all this stuff. And I'm like, you know, if I'm shooting super eight, am I really that concerned about pin registration? Yeah. Like <laughs> maybe I don't know. Like I'm not going to be shooting green screen on Super 8. If I want Super 8, I want I want texture. That's what I'm doing Super 8 for. I think it's it's cool to do that. I think it's interesting too that cuz I've heard the DP who worked uh, on second unit on Chosen when I was second unit directing Chosen was all excited about shooting something on film. Like like there's the romance of film has maybe even been heightened by the mundacity of digital even though digital looks unbelievably fucking amazing today yes like there's like a romance amongst filmmakers about and i don't share this romance because i went to film school when i had to pay for my own film stock and processing and so when i watch my films from film school i I literally think of the tables i had to wait to pay for the films like yes like i'd have to work for two days to to save up like two days of waiting tables would equal 10 minutes of of 16 millimeter raw stock that's right and i'm or, like or they're processing i knew so many people in film school it's yeah. like they shot something but then they couldn't afford to actually see it they had to then work for oh like yeah a week or two no yeah the first two films i made on film i shot them on film and they lived in my refrigerator like one of them for a couple of months one of them for like like three or four months uh, before i could afford to process them that was the sacrifice you yeah made. that was what that's what you did for your art you made a movie and you stuck it in your fridge and i also remember when she left orlando florida which is where i'm from the dp who shot my thesis film nancy kroll had a bunch of short ends from various projects and just gave them to me she's like hey here go crazy and i and i was like cool but there was never like the right project for you know random assortment of short 180, ends. 180 like, feet of something yes. it's like exactly it was like different stocks black and white and color and reversal and whatever and so it was like you know like really it would be like a music video that just didn't care about it just the aesthetic is that it's a collage yeah and uh nobody in orlando ever had enough money to give me that i could even have afforded to do it and so when i moved out of orlando i gave it all to somebody else I'll tell you, it was it was very interesting listening to um, Kodak and the the panel of, of filmmakers at the festival. Um, one of the other things that came up was that Kodak had a hundred movies shot on film last year, and features. I think, uh, that's what they said: a hundred feature films. Bullshit. Are they including like is that worldwide or is that just in America? I think that's worldwide. Okay, so that's got to be like in India where they shoot every movie 17 times. Well, they I don't think they shoot every movie 17 <laughs> times, but it's they, they might have, you know, parts 1 through 7 or something. Well, they'll sh- they'll sh- I I've heard maybe I'm a horrible uh uh like outsider when I say this, but I've heard that they'll shoot the same movie like in three different dialects or something. You know what? I don't think they're really shooting a lot of film in India anymore. I think that's actually really changed. It seems like it's a lot of digital going yeah. on now too. So uh, we should get someone on the show though who is an expert. So we should get a Kodak rep we, on the show. I think it would be so interesting to to talk to them about it because I'm not against shooting on film. I, I mean, like the the film look is awesome, and we've strove for it forever. But I'll talk to, especially when I talk to filmmakers who came up in the digital world who romanticize film, and they'll say, "Well, I'd love to shoot film someday." And I'll, I'll, I describe it this, this way. 
and I've always described it this way. It's like, imagine you go to art school and every pencil you get costs a thousand dollars and is like a half inch long. You won't make any wrong marks with that pencil. Every mark you make is going to be the perfect part of the drawing that you're doing. Like you, you, you can't afford to waste it when I'm again, when I'm thinking that like I would wait tables for two days cause I was a wretched waiter. Mm-hmm. So in two days of waiting tables, I could make, you know, the $120 that it would cost to buy 400 feet of whatever, uh, 7248, a hundred ASA. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that was 72 was the designation for 16 millimeter and 52 Correct. is the designation for Correct. 35. Wow. It, it, very, very good, Ben. You, it, you it, filled your, you've memorized this stuff. It never goes away, man. So, I, so two pin code for many years for my, uh, <laughs> for, for my, my ATM card was like 7248 or something. Remember that, learn that time travelers <laughs> and you can go steal from Ilya in the past when he didn't have any money to steal anyway. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so yeah, so I would work seriously. 20 hours of waiting tables I could turn into 10 minutes of raw footage in 16 millimeters and uh, you know and then you got the fun of using rent rewinds and, and well <laughs> well and I was I was an outlier at my film school because I would do everything digitally so I would process it uh, and we we had a lab in Florida called Continental I doubt they're still in existence mm. certainly the Orlando branch of Continental is definitely not there and uh, they were all right and uh, they weren't great and, uh, they would, they would do your processing and then nothing else that ever needed to be done for your film could be done locally in Orlando or even in Florida. Most of it had to be done out of New York, which included things like sound optical negative cutting. Um, I was able to like to do, to do something as simple as titles, titles. And I just had titles that were white titles on black that faded up and faded down Uh, I had to get everything printed onto photo positives and put them onto animation paper and then take them to an animation stand. And there's uh, a guy named uh, Bernie Noga who would, uh, who worked at UCF's uh, animation stand. Very nice guy, still in touch with him. And he would, you'd give him exactly how many frames. uh, And I think you might've had to give him feet and frames of every title. And then he would shoot them for you. I mean, it was like, every goddamn step of this was torture and 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 this is uncreative bullshit torture this isn't like the torture of, of, of and it's not that it was torture working this with bernie you did for the film look bernie's a sweet guy but yeah this is this is this is the <laughs> bullshit that you would go through you know bernie's listening to this now he's gonna be like that jerk ben bernie's a big fan <laughs> no no bernie, bernie's a great guy uh but but the thing is it's like we ha- like you know you have to learn all of these stupid things when i moved out to la i was finishing up a short film that we'd shot on 35 mm-hmm. i cashed in every favor before i moved out to uh, LA. And so did my producer, by the way, a guy, you know, Jay Bogdano, which we cashed oh, yeah. in a shit ton of favors and shot this short on 35 millimeter. And this time around, like we were in LA. And so there's just a company that does titles and you bring them the shit and the, give them the font and they did it. And this is 1999. So yeah. it was a few years later, but to me, every step of that is pain and anguish and also expensive as fuck. And let's compare it to how you do it today. You open Adobe premiere. Yep. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you're done. And you're yeah. Done. Well, yeah, uh, uh, the, the thing about it is like when you like back then you'd finish your film and you, and no legitimate film festival would run a video of any kind. So you would That's have true. to get a print made. That's true. And so you'd have to hire a negative cutter and negative cutters charge by the cut, by the way. And there was ridiculously few of them and you had to find one that was actually really good that knew yeah. all about how to basically take cement and emulsion and put things <laughs> together. So. And, and seriously, cutting your own negative is like being your own lawyer at a murder trial. Do not cut your own negative. <laughs> Hire a professional to do oh that. My God, you make one mistake. You make one mistake. That, oh, it's yeah. Terrible. We, for the, for my senior thesis, it was N and D film and video limited in, that's in uh, New York mm. and they were at, at a uh, do art. Mm. And then when I moved out here it was jr post which was actually not very far from where we are now a woman named joy she was great she was awesome but it's like i'm paying somebody thousands of dollars to redo something i've already done that's not actually a creative thing so today what you do is you export a prores file of your final thing and then you take it to a company that makes dcps and you pay them like two three hundred bucks and they make a dcp of your short if it's a feature you might have to pay them a few thousand dollars to make a dcp of your feature they turn around in a day they put it in dropbox or give it to you on a thumb drive and bob's your uncle that's it 
have a nice day. Yeah. And you never have to, you never have to have a prank. I mean, it's like, okay, would I exchange the experience of watching Dunkirk on an IMAX screen with film or uh, even um, the hateful eight in 70 millimeter, which I saw at the Sherman Oaks arc light, whenever that came out year, year and a half ago, two years ago. But, um, but, but I mean, I think that it's legitimate and I think that film, it is legitimate for film to be an art form and for people to still use it creatively, but I don't miss it as like the thing you had to do. Hmm. I, I feel like I should make a direct parallel somehow here to like Tommy Wiseau's the room. Cause that was also shot on film, but it was also shot in high def at the same time. It was, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, so I don't know. There was a time when everything was shot in film and clearly not everything needed to be so maybe we are just now sort of like fulfilling the prophecy of like we where we always needed to get to like maybe film is the event movie maybe film is for something that has to have a particular patina i mean i assure you that the room did not need to be shot on film well and i really i do question like i do think dunkirk would be really hard to do on you know a red epic or whatever but uh but i (sighs) I wonder, <laughs> like, I, I, I do wonder how, I bet it would look fantastic on the Alexa 65. I mean, I don't know. It's yeah. an amazing camera. So. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's hard to say, uh, without, you know, doing the Pepsi challenge and doing them side by side. Um, but you know, uh, years ago when I was working for, uh, Ron Howard, uh, I asked him about far and away, which is a feature that he, right. sh- he shot on 70 millimeter. Yeah. And I was a projectionist when that movie came out and Ooh. at a second run theater, but we had a projector that could be retrofitted for 70 millimeter. So I actually Fantastic. got to project that thing in 70 and I asked him if he thought it was worth it. And he said that he thought that, uh, I hope I'm not speaking out of school here, Ron, you can call me up and yell at me. Um, he said that he thought that the story was not epic enough and the, and that they got so much press out of having shot it in 70 millimeter that it kind of made people go there expecting, you you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to say Lawrence of Arabia. And in fact, you know, it, it's like, it's a character story and it didn't need to be in 70 in his opinion. I mean, obviously Dunkirk is something that needs the scope it's a movie that's about scope. So that makes sense. Uh, but I just don't know, you know, a lot of our stories are about characters. There's, uh, uh, five predominant elements as I was taught in a, in a directing book and they are character dialogue, theme spectacle and Oh, and story and story. Thank you. So those are the five predominant elements. And I feel like when you're dealing with spectacle, that's when you want scope. And, you know, if you're making Lawrence of Arabia, if you're making Dunkirk, it makes sense. I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here and disagree with Ron Howard about his own movie. Okay. I think, it, I think it actually has a lot of good scope and spectacle. And there's some wonderful, wonderful shots of like, you know, uh, the, the land rush going on you know, through Oklahoma and like, you know, hundreds of horses and wagons oh, yeah. and people and all kinds I, of I mean, I don't think Ron would disagree with any of that. I just think that he, he thought that the the marketing of the film became about that it was in 70 millimeter and it was the mm-hmm. first movie to be shot in 70 millimeter since I forget. Cause that was like was a long time. That's early nineties. Right. I think is when 90, that movie came out. 92. And, uh, I think that there, a movie hadn't been made in 70 millimeter, I think since the sixties. Wow. Uh, you know, it's Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman and it got a lot of press. And I, I don't know if I remember the movie all that well, like at least the story of the movie, but I did find it like yeah. a spectacle. There's these wonderful shots. I want to say of like, Christmas times, like in Brooklyn or something like at the turn of the century or yeah, yeah. It's like a, that was all the fantastic long thing. before the artisanal mayonnaise shops moved. Actually in. not even turn of the century way before the turn of the century. It was, it was I thought it was, you know, great you art design, great production. Went right past my so, artisanal mayonnaise shop yeah, joke. I, yeah. I, 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 fair enough. You, you were, you were baiting me. I, I wasn't was, going to, I wasn't going to take that. I wasn't taking fine. the bait. So. Hey, uh, let's talk about Airy. Okay. Airy, uh, you know, our sponsor for the show here, they do amazing, amazing, stuff and uh you know they're turning a hundred this year airy turns 100 yeah crazy can you believe it airy's like only five years older than you and me that's amazing (laughs) well airy a hundred year old company and uh i got contacted actually by variety recently they wanted uh, me to advertise in variety to be to help celebrate uh, and you said thanks a lot old man i have a podcast maybe you've heard of those oh i'll go back to your print publication (laughs) 
<laughs> I said, you know, uh, I, I can't afford you variety, but I will talk about them on my podcast. And uh, and they're a great sponsor of the show. And uh, we love Aerie. So thank well, you. Very I much know I say this every time, support. but yeah. like Aerie is the best at everything they do. They are the gold standard in this business. And uh, I learned how to work on Aerie cameras. And uh, every every chance I get, I still work with Aerie, Aerie gear. And when you see their name on something, you know if it's a follow focus or if it's a friggin' rod, it's the best one that could possibly have been engineered and made. You get what you pay for. You get high-end professional. Happy this. birthday, Ari. That's elderly for a camera company. That's that's They are the elder statement. There's no other camera company older than, than Ari. So uh, you, you were telling me some interesting stuff about the, the Ari company. It's, it's founded by two friends, right? Yeah, they're two friends. And they were uh, teenagers, right? Yes, that's right. Uh August Arnold and uh, Robert Richter, and they were teenagers when they started the company, and they made a copy machine. That wow, was their, that was their very first product. But uh, and then they just turned it on its side and said, "Holy crap, we can make movies with this thing." <laughs> I'm sure that's not what they said. That's but. exactly that's the birth of the first Airflex camera. <laughs> um, you want to make us lose this sponsorship? Though, I don't. I don't. Guess. I really love them. So uh, I, Air, I love Aries Gear. It's the best. Airy today has five business units: camera systems, lighting, media, rentals, and medical. And uh, they're basically kicking butt at everything they do they they are the gold standard for the industry and uh it's amazing that they're turning 100 i always month. think that like when you talk about precision german engineering like airy is is like the poster child for precision engineering when you get a piece of airy gear you know it's going to do exactly the, what it's supposed to do you know that it's been ergonomically designed so that it does it as well as possible i don't know a single cameraman who would rather have any other camera but an airy on their shoulder all day long yeah, their ergonomics are really second to none. They're, re- they're really, really impressive. And uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. People I know in this industry, if you think about like German engineering, you think of like BMW and Airy. Those yeah. are like, that's... that's if cool. Airy made a car, I would be proud to drive it. Yeah. Maybe, you know what? Uh, Red's making a phone. Maybe... Uh, are they? <laughs> Red's making a phone. Yeah, that's their latest product. What? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, they, that's that's their next uh, innovation as a phone. Uh, we'll have to talk about that off yeah. mic. Ne- next, yeah, next yeah, that, episode. That'll be our next... Okay, who's on the show this uh, this episode? Well, I couldn't be prouder in, in, in my life that we got to talk to one of my favorite DPs on Earth, Rodney Charters. Yes. Uh, oh, that's right, because we had the war story last time, and yeah. we talked all about 24... But uh, yeah, Rodney is fantastic. And we could fill three episodes with Rodney. Yeah. Rodney is not just of an amazing DP. And not only is he somebody who I think kind of created a template that is all action television and a lot of action movies today. Like I feel like even if you watch the Bourne movies, I feel like they are a reference to the groundbreaking work that he did in like 2001 on 24. He took he takes things to another level. But beyond that, dude's just fascinating. <sighs> when I grow up, I want to be Rodney Charters. <laughs> and without further ado, Rodney Charters. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I'm here at uh, Central Command, a recording studio, which we've never recorded in. It's very fancy. With uh, cinematographer Rodney Charters. Rodney, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. The, the network in Toronto, I work for this place called CTV, and they had a policy of throwing everything away. And then one time, Hinckley, remember, he took a pot shot at the president. Uh-huh. He showed up in in Ottawa when the president visited, and he was in the crowd, and we photographed him. Oh, no. In this news item. And, uh, of course, it became apparent that he'd been there. Press people had stills of him, but we had the only video of him in the crowd, and, and they, they roll up in these big bulletproof limos, big Lincolns, uh-huh. And the, you couldn't know which one the president was in. It was like three of them would go through the CIA, and then finally the one would stop and he'd get out. Uh-huh. And Hinckley was there. And so they, CBS and ABC and the big networks in the States started calling and saying, we knew you had a cameraman there. You must have the footage. And they'd kind of thrown it out, right? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but the, so fortunately, it wasn't completely thrown out. So they managed to resurrect it. And then from that day on, they decided to keep everything. But <laughs> But like all the film footage that they were shooting, yeah. like all the 16 millimeter, did yeah. they just trash that when they were done? They'd used to, uh, and they would only keep the finished program. But that prompted them, that incident prompted that network to decide to archive. Wow. But, you know, archiving film is just a major, archiving anything is a major deal. I mean, I'm confronting now, I just, I just got a, I think it's 64 terabyte array. <laughs> Good God. Because uh, I have hundreds of 
discs with stuff on it. And yeah. I don't know where it is. There's a really good program called Neo Finder, which allows you to pop a drive in and catalog it. And then you can look at your catalog and you search your catalog without having the drives mounted. So oh, wow. you can go through and find, well, where are all my iTunes collections? What drives do, are they on? You know, oh, Some wow. of them had backups, some of them don't. Some of them, because you, you throw out iTunes a lot because it takes up too much space on your yeah. hard drive. And then there's the photos and the videos. So, you know, kids, childhood, growing up, and all of that is in DHS. It's on Sony tape way back, beta, yeah. and then it did DV cam. And I have just so many DV cam on. tapes. I mean, I, I kind of enter the picture with DV cam. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, and beta cam. Well, I have film from 67. Wow. You that know, you still have? I still have a print, and it's badly scratched. Um, they did a wet gate because a museum in New Zealand put it on it as a retrospective of the early Auckland in the late mid-60s. <laughs> and um, anyhow, they, they put it out as a gallery exhibit and they had the film running continuously. So they did a quite a nice transfer. It's still scratched. I had gate scratch and so on. It was my head. Um, yeah, but it's kind of the... I don't know. There's something charming about it. You know, it's it's kind of an well, artifact. The film of, is really quite powerful. It's an early rock video. And in fact, I used the Yardbirds. And we had a band in New Zealand called the Ladi Dars. And they did a cover track for me um, of a Ladi Dars album. And then their number one hit became the theme song. And I did the music rights and everything. We did it all in 67. And it was 10 minutes long, black and white. It was called Film Exercise. And I think the galleries now ask me if they can put it online. It's probably better that the gallery does it than, than <laughs> I do it. Um, Let them pay for that. But it was great. It was 16 millimeter, Switter, 10 mil was my fave with a pistol grip. Mm -hmm. It was a great little camera. It's actually taken till now to get a 35 mil digital equivalent of that. The 2C, um, was great. It had that kind of physicality, quite small and hand holdable with a small, especially with a hundred foot load or two hundred foot load. And then we got the newer version out of Ari. But now with the Alexa Mini and the Red, you can cradle a camera physically at your chest level and push it towards someone and pull it back and so on. Um, but it's taken a long time to come down in size from the Panaflexes and the big <laughs> studio Aries and so on. Yeah, for real. And, you know, even we're shooting on a show now, there's Alexa Mini, and then we have three of them, and they're working beautifully. We're shooting anamorphic in 4.3, and we're center cropping using the software inside the camera to extract the 16 by 9. But the boys told me that with the short zoom, and of course, given it's an anamorphic zoom, it, it weighs in at 38 pounds. So that's, we have to go to a prime to get hand holdable. Uh, I mean, we can hold it at that level, but we can get it down another 10 pounds if we get rid of the zoom because they're glasses, serious glasses being anamorphic and <laughs> Panavision. Wow. Let's go back to the beginning of your story. While I became aware of you in the, in the 90s with a, a certain horror movie, but also big time with 24, but like looking at your bios and stuff, so you're originally from New Zealand, correct? Correct, yeah. A and uh, your father was a photographer. Yeah, he was a still photographer in a small town called New Plymouth, and he and his partner had met during the war when they were both Air Force photo techs mm -hmm. in the South Pacific in Guadalcanal and other bases throughout the country. Well, throughout Solomon Islands, about 35 different bases. And one of the things that I grew up that kind of influenced me was um, an album, a scrapbook album that he had put together after the war of negatives that he had shot. The guys swimming in the pool in Hamburg base and Guadalcanal and uh, Emerau and all the different bases that they were there. And unfortunately, as one never does when your father's getting old and you you just never seem to have the time to sit down and say, hey, Dad, what did you do in the war, you know? <laughs> um, but fortunately, one of his uh, buddies from that time has survived, and I did do an interview with him on a C300 and, you know, double system sound and tried to make a good job of it. Uh, but the um, the reality is that you have to make it up, and this album was the starting place for me in my intervening years. I didn't care about it. And then after he passed it, 
it, my brother said, oh, you better keep it, you can be the archivist. Mm -hmm. And um, there were some 300 shots that were printed because the negatives were being very big. Some of them were four by five because they used the aerial plate cameras that he had access oh, wow. to. Um, so some of them were quite beautiful and he just kept the negatives and smuggled them back to New Zealand and printed them after the war. Well, actually as part of his demod process and made this big album. So those images are part of my early childhood experience of documenting life, strange mm -hmm. life. What are the kinds of images that you saw in there that, that really struck you? Well, it was about the boys, you know, their dark room was a tent and they had a great struggle keeping temperatures because it was in the Pacific, in the middle of the tropics. So he said that the American supplies were always dropped on the beach at night and they would go down and find an air conditioning unit and put a big stencil on it saying Royal New Zealand Air Force and stencil <laughs> over the American <laughs> markings and then tell the Americans to deliver it to them. Right? <laughs> <laughs> a shipment came in for us last night, right? <laughs> and so he, they were quite enterprising, but they, they basically never wore clothes. There's just this historic picture of them, all the boys naked swimming in the lagoon, <laughs> or they're all building their tent dark room with nothing on, or just the big planks of wood in the appropriate places to, <laughs> to preserve modesty. Um, and it looked like a giant, Boy Scout camp, you know, they, <laughs> because they were behind lines, they were with the air bases uh, servicing. Yeah, one of the tasks was to process gun camera footage uh, with the 30 mil cannon cameras and the P-51s and so on, would fire a frame every time a bullet went out of the gun. So basically you'd have this 50, I, I, they were probably about six feet long, and so they would be dunk tank developed in a processing tank that was six or eight feet high. Jesus. And one of the stories that his partner told me only recently, funnily, and you know, 75, 80 years later, <laughs> was that my father Roy made quite a lot of money and actually bought our house in this small town, this big mansion that he had to hack his way through the old forest. An old woman had died, and this place was derelict during the war. And we lived in it, and, and it became a kind of uh, PTSD space for members of the core of his friends who had come back damaged from the war for whatever reasons and they were to hang out in our house and I remember them as a child as a baby and then one of them said that I saved his life because he became my mom gave me to him to take care of me daily you know bottle feed whatever oh, wow. and it kind of brought him back to life and he went on for had a great career in London as a musicologist and got into the business because he, he ended up being the guy in London. If you wanted music for your movies in the 50s, you would go to him and he would have all the new pressings from all the record companies in the world and, and famous directors would go there to him and sit and listen to albums and make decisions about music that they'd like to use, classically based mostly, of course, uh -huh. um, in their movies. Anyhow, he told me this story. He said, my father used to get booze in New Zealand and the pilots would fly it up because that was the support area was out of New Zealand to yeah. the Solomons and um, then he would hide it in the deep tank where they process the gun camera and he'd tie it on strings and then drop it in because this is brown soup that just yeah. you couldn't see anything and they made little hooks on the side of the tank with strings on them because no one ever found that they had hundreds of bottles of booze in these tanks <laughs> and he did quite well out of it apparently did you meet him again like when you were in the film business and and were you able to talk about that at all well my father of course was still working when i left new zealand and went to the Royal College of Art in London, went to film school, but I used his camera to make the movie that got me into the college. Uh -huh. It's this a film called Film Exercise. It was my second year at, a, at an art school in Auckland and the university, and um, that opened the door for me, and I got into the film school. Uh, Tony Scott was a year of me, ahead of me, and Stephen Goldblatt was wow. a year of me. I mean, there were great people that went to the school. We had very little footage, um, camera uh, equipment. We had a couple of old Eclair NPRs, mm -hmm. and actually they were quite special. We had some old Aries. Like S cameras? Yeah, 16 mil. Uh, there was no 35, but Tony went on to do quite lovely work with Stephen and other people. We made great films. I made a little documentary about a New Zealand couple that were living in London, black and white, and the uh, New Zealand film people bought it, the television company bought it and broadcast it. And so oh, wow. 
So it was it was a good training ground. And then I had worked summer relief. I, I had to go before a board, but I worked at the BBC as a sound dubbing recordist uh, in an old studio out at Ealing, mm-hmm. uh, which is, is still Ealing Studios. I worked there a little recently, and it was kind of fun to go back and see the old recording room is gone now because literally I had a tiny space. I was the 35 mil mag recordist. And, oh, wow. And I had this big mag stripe, 1,000 foot rolls. So that means that you're taking like quarter inch tape and dubbing it over to- Well, I didn't ever do that. I simply was the guy who pressed record and made sure that the film ran through the gate and was in sync. So mm-hmm. if we, there was a 10 minute roll, it wasn't rock and roll, you couldn't go back. You had to keep going forward. So if you uh. made a mistake, you'd go back and start again. But I had a punch mark and I had to set it up on the, on the, the record head and they would do this Selsun interlock was a system where all the machines, all the playback, 35 mil mag stripe machines would all lock to my recorder. And I was in another room on the other side of the property and there was a mixer and of course he had the picture up uh-huh. and uh, he would push go and my recorder would kick into gear with all the other playback decks old technology so like for for people because i think a lot of people who listen to this are probably from a time before editing on film certainly so so whatever was shot in the field had to be recorded onto audio tape that looked like 35 millimeter film no it was transferred they were using nagras by then quarter yeah. quarter inch reel to reel tape what, recorder but that's and, what i'm saying they would record quarter inch and yeah. then you were in a facility that would take that and then turn that into basically audio tape that looked like 35 that was correct exactly like 35 millimeter film so that it would run parallel through yeah. like a flatbed or whatever prior to time code yeah uh, we had footage count that was stamped on the footage and stamped yeah. on the sound um, once it was synchronized, and I had a raw roll, and all of the sound tracks were coming back to me, and they were being recorded on my deck. Mm-hmm. So I had to just make sure that nothing happened during that process and resync it every time we went back to the start. Um, at that time, the BBC did have a rock and roll system based on an old Keller flatbed, which many film people still use the Keller system, um, I think. Probably they've changed over, but Spielberg, when he's cutting film, still uses a Keller-style flatbed. Mm -hmm. Um, And they would be just like a steam bag, a flatbed with different plates. Yeah, yeah. And the 35 mil mag stripe would flow through those, and they'd have a bunch of them linked together with with a hard drive connection. So they would all roll together, but you could roll backwards with that. Yeah. So that was the beginning to say, oh, we made a mistake. We'll roll back and we'll punch in just the way people did with multi-track. Yeah, yeah. And you punch in to go into record and then you start and continue your mix and you keep going that way. But that where you worked, they didn't have that system. They they didn't have it in, in Ealing, but I did do a spot at the BBC Television Center where we had a rock, rock and roll system. And in those days, m- much of the sound effects was spun in off discs. The, the BBC had a very, very elaborate disc library of uh, 45 discs, small ones, and there'd be six like gramophone actual, actual record records. players. That's right. And there'd be a great big pot and a needle drop, and you they would cue it up <laughs> and hit play <laughs> and bring up the sound. So if you wanted gunfire or something, oh, man. that's how they would do it. And I wouldn't the, last five minutes. Well, fascinating, because footsteps they would make footsteps out of a rushing weir a little water weir mm-hmm. with a little bit of water tripping over be continuous sound but they would watch the feet and they would bring the pot up in time with the feet and they would make this sound effects <laughs> i mean our whole world is fake fake and make believe yeah yeah and you know cut to the present i'm actually having a lot of fun because i'm doing a show now which takes place in a different city in a different part of the world every week and we're all doing it in hollywood Mm-hmm. And we're just cheating everything. So all those kind of <laughs> old t- style techniques are coming back. Of course, we are using green screen and where it's a digital shoot and we can do a lot better compositing. But all of these tricks go back to the early days when people found ways of emulating reality on a sound stage or in, a, in an actual film stage where you're doing filming. Um, and you would cheat, you know. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, the the... the the playback room in the suite was fast because it had 25, 35 mil mag stripe machines. That is, as he says, they weigh a thousand pounds each. My recorder weighed a thousand pounds, and yeah. it was a vertical rack that was seven feet tall. And and, and what know, do they do with all these? Like, so did they archive any of that stuff? No, it was all junked. I mean, I, I think you can probably get Perfect Tone. I think was probably the company. They were Swiss. 
mm-hmm. were beautifully made, beautifully made. And the Keller flatbeds was the sound only version of the chem. Oh, okay. So you had a chem at one end playing picture, and in, it was into a, a there was had to be a plumber cone tube recording that image that made the tape, right? Because yeah. it all went to tape to go to air. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the amazing thing is, though, this was a show called The World Tonight or something that I was working on just briefly as an assistant. And it was an hour long, and they would record it in two bursts of 30 minutes each. And they would have a guy come over and take from, put it in a motorcycle, run downstairs literally, and motorcycle about a mile across this complex at BBC Television Center to lace it up and make it go to air. And while they were playing the first reel, we were still dubbing the second reel. That's how scary that got. <laughs> it was madness. <laughs> so hence the whole gram swinging thing. Those guys were so adept at popping in all that background stuff that wow. nobody had time to find. And you know, it was fast. It was really fast as they would preset a bunch of discs and you could see them they're very skilled at flipping these discs back and forth, needle dropping on the they're exact like DJs. Track. They're like modern day DJs. Yeah. Yeah. It was really fun. That's incredible. See. Yeah. So, so how do well? First of all, I kind of want to hear a little bit more about starting out in New Zealand and, and making films in New Zealand. What year about would this be? There'd be sixty-seven. Well, I left in sixty-eight. So I went to the film made it into a film festival in Sydney in sixty-seven. Um, so mid sixties, so, like what? What is the filmmaking atmosphere like in New Zealand back then? Well, there wasn't none really. Uh, there were some people making. Uh, the government had a publicity wing. And called the film board and you could join that it was very similar to the Canadian film board out of Montreal and they made um, tourist films um, one of their alumni was a guy called Brian Brake who became a very famous time life photographer and was a founding member of Magnum the stills uh, group that's founded out of Paris and he and my father knew each other because they would come through and photograph Taranaki for publicity. And my father and my mother, I found, I went into a museum recently and I'm standing, staring at this picture and I realize this is my mom and dad walking around the Mar- a Maori Pa site. And even more oh, extraordinary wow. is, there's pictures of me as a child in this movie. It was about Taranaki, uh, the province where New Plymouth is. And that was really strangely weird. <laughs> But the cameraman, of course, they would come to my dad's studio as a kind of stopping place because he knew the best spots to film the mountain. And we have a Fuji-style mountain, which is perpetual snow, but during the winter it would get down to about 3,000 feet, and it's it's 9,000, 8,500 feet high. Mm -hmm. So it was quite spectacular. And where the valleys and the cows and the trees and the, where was the best place to shoot this? My father knew because they were always traveling around doing weddings from, was they driving from A to B? And they would say, we stop and take a picture of that particular spot. So they would tell these cinematographers. And then on this occasion, to go to a Maori burial, actually a fortification on the top of a hill with the truncated um, ramparts where they put up the big stakes and so on. Yeah. You can still see all of that in place from 150 years ago. And my mum and dad are walking up the side of this and then walking around and the voiceover talks about it being a par site in the mountains in the background. So he was instrumental in having liaison with these cinematographers. So of course he early on and his partner said, we gotta have a camera. And he made quite a lot of documentaries. I was in many of them, eight millimeter, super eight. Yeah, They were about, uh, well, the backstory is that when the return services came back, the airmen and so on, uh, soldiers to New Zealand, the government allowed them to get free land in the interior, deep in the interior that was fully bush covered. But the challenge was they had to get to it. So they'd had to build their own roads through the bush, oh, wow. felling trees, selling the timber, stripping the land, and then planting grass. So that process was years in the making. But as a child, I remember carrying the detonators for the blasting <laughs> in a little wooden box with shavings in it. And I was the guy that they would come to. And, and they would, they had one of these Husqvarna drills with an eight-foot drill bit that was the core size of a stick of gelignite. And of course, these guys were all out of the war, so there was nothing to them, this kind of muni- munition stuff. And we'd drill into the side of this. It was hot. It was popper clay it was called it was kind of quasi limestone it was relatively soft 
but you needed to blow it out to get the bulldozer in and start cutting through the cliffs. Yeah. And so they would they fill the trees, then they come along with a bulldozer and they get to a point where they needed to blast, they drill into the side, they put six sticks of dynamite in, I remember, and then they would put in my detonator into the last stick and shove it in, and it had about a foot slow fuse on it. Well, they would flick out their Bix and they'd light it, and we'd all run for cover and the thing would blow, and then we'd go back in with the bulldozer. So That's my, insane. I, I haven't found these movies. I, I know where they are, but they need to be transferred. I don't know whether they'll play anymore, but they were quite fascinating. Oh, my so God, you've got to get those. Well, it got me going into, oh, because we would see them. And then my dad would get movies if there was a birthday party. The, there was a ballroom, a small, modest ballroom in this house, and he cut a projector port up the top and put glass in, put an old 16 bell and howl up there, and he would play movies if I had a birthday party, and all the kids would come, and he'd get the young, the young rascals, and he'd get all these Hollywood 16 mil movies, and we'd watch them. And he was a member of the society, the film society, and they would get more obscure European films that wouldn't make it into the theater. I mean, uh -huh. amazingly in that time, New Zealand was had the second highest standard of living in the world in the 50s and 60s, right behind America. And we had five cinemas in our town, so people went to the movies. This is all before television. Television didn't arrive in our town until the late 70s. Really? And and Well, no, wow. I'm saying it would be late 60s. But I remember watching Gunsmoke with my dad and, and the Westerner. Yeah. Um, but loved what was going on with all of that and thought that he was making documentaries, but he did make a little movie about me. And so I played a, a little kid who gets his trains coming and on my legs stuck in the, <laughs> in the trestle bridge and there was danger and, you know, uh -huh. called The White Goat. And so that was a an exposure to me of behind the scenes, in front of the camera, 16 mil bollock. So I borrowed that to make a movie. And uh, the movie was this kind of rock video thing, uh -huh. early, early days, which may be online soon. I have to find out where that is. And um, it got me into the college in London. So then I just left and never came back, basically. <laughs> but Pete, this was well before Peter Jackson. So Obviously. there was really nothing going on. Yeah. And it only last year did I come back to New Zealand to work. I worked on an MTV series that called the Shannara Chronicles. They had me down for a couple of episodes and a bunch of other stuff uh -huh. uh, big fantasy series uh, Alexa anamorphic sander extraction beautiful lots of fabulous wetter mm -hmm. enhanced uh, <laughs> prosthetic makeup oh I bet know, $50,000 heads for yeah. villains and so on and castles and werewolves I mean, it was really Sounds like a lot, a lot of, fun. of fun a lot of fun did you get to like blow up any mountains just for old time's sake no 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 but of course 24 did give me that feeling because we blew up a lot on 24 <laughs> blew up a whole lot on 24 <laughs> Okay, so you're working as a re-recording mixer, or uh, it was just a summer relief job. Uh, you so know, they would they had 54 crews in London at the BBC at the time I was there, and they'd send them all away for the summer. They would take their summer holiday, uh -huh. so they would hire freelance people to come in and fill in. And that's what I did at BBC Ealing. Was that like your first big? Your your it was first... my first official film job. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was paid, and I got into the union, which at that time was very tight. You couldn't work unless you were in the union. Uh, subsequently, rock videos, funnily enough, blew that out of the water because the kids just weren't going to play that game. <laughs> That's happening now on YouTube. Yeah. So how do you transition from that into shooting? Well, it was just a temporary job. I did have the card, so I worked on commercials with both Tony. I did his first commercial, bless his heart. Um, it was oh, a wow. Ribena commercial. And um, I was the third guy on the sound crew. Another guy in our in our school uh, became a mixer because nobody was available and he showed up with the Nagra from the school and they gave him the, that job. A lot of people get a career that way. Yeah. Were you, at this point, I guess my big question is, were you focused on you wanted you wanted to shoot or did you know what you wanted to do yet? No. I mean, I, I understood documentary in the concept of that. I made a quasi-drama film, but not really. And there was no clear path in the early stages of our film school as to how to get into drama. Mm-hmm you were on the outside because we didn't have union accreditation and we were not able to get into the union. The British Film School started soon after in my final year and they were locked in a deal with the union so if you graduated from there you could work. Um, so I I suppose I wandered and what happened was I made a movie 
um, for the Baha'is uh, about seals and crafts. They came to London and I knew them as Baha'is and so I made a, a movie we shot at the Roundhouse and a bunch of stuff around London. And then I took it to the States to sell it and people wanted slight changes so I had to find money to make the changes. It was mm -hmm. 16 mil films, still cost money. So is this money. a documentary? It was a documentary about their being in London. And when you said you made it, you directed it? You directed it I directed and, shot it? and cut it okay. and, uh, and shot it. So, so now you kind I'm of one-man band your, your way through well, it. Well, yes. I mean, certainly the f first film I made was absolutely that because nobody else knew. And I actually cut film 16 mil when my dad, he would do uh, with a cement splice and lose a frame. Uh -huh. And then they would get the finished film mag striped and then they would lay a track back on it. It was the early primitive days. <laughs> and I knew about double system because a very early film, when I had a great tutor at the, Royal, at the not at the Royal College so much, but at the school in Auckland. And he would, had been also a time life photographer and his last great project was in China in the 50s, in 57 he was kicked out, but he spent three months photographing in China, black and white of course, mm -hmm. amazing stuff. And he introduced me to the British film unit, the transport film department, and they had a film that was called Snow which was, a, you can find it online. It's amazingly well cut, a montage of trains clearing snow line, lines that are covered in snow. And it's all cut to a, a very uh, percussion-y drum beat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I realized that the bed in my rock video film wanted that kind of integration. And uh, I talked the drummer of this band into doing various tracks for me and then we wrote music accordingly that I could then utilize in the edit. And I was cutting double system. Mm -hmm. But when I first started the first piece of 16 mil, I cut it with a razor blade and I joined it with tape and I punched out the holes <laughs> with something sharp that I could find <laughs> so that we go through the gate on the projector. Oh, wow. Um, and it was and hope, hope it didn't jam. Right. And, and I didn't know about separate mag stripe at that point. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, today people don't have an understanding of the physicality that you had to do. But there were many things about cutting film when you had pulled your strips out and you would hang them on pins I remember. in a bag. And you could hold a handful of 50 shots in your hand and up against a white background, you could flick through and see the image and you knew which take you wanted and you would pull it out. Whereas now, you have to go in a linear fashion through a reel mm -hmm. to look, even in software versions. It's only in very, very recent times now with the software allowing you to look at a bin and see the head clip. Yeah, yeah. And But you have to click it to play it. It's not quite the same because a lot of people would pull film through their fingers and they, you could tell what was happening. <laughs> you got used to doing that, you know. Was your I know. Thing? When I was in film school, we had those and I always remember the experience of turning the bin upside down to find like those four the frames. tiny, yes, <laughs> yes, it drive you crazy. <laughs> My daughter tells a very funny story. I let her play with the trim trims that were in the base and she would make up these tiny movies that were two frame three frames <laughs> long <laughs> and play them you know and she has a fond memory of that so she has a, a movie on itunes now so she, that taught her to get she was hooked you know that's cool but uh, so many stories from that time that they no longer have any relevance to anybody it's just there was a history of it all mm -hmm. nowadays everything's non-linear and you know, I'm working with LUTs and I control a camera with LUTs. I see exactly what the final image is. I record it on my desktop. I have iris control. I mean, there isn't anything that I can't do with yeah. modern cinematography setup. Do you feel like there's anything lost because of that? Or do you feel like, uh, as I've been following your career, again, for probably at least 15, 20 years, like you've always seemed to be someone who would gravitate towards new technology when it came out and you would use it. Well, part is job preservation. Time marches on, the technology changes, and those who adopt move on. Those who don't get left behind. Yeah. It's very simple. So very early on, for some reason, I I had a, transistors were in my blood. When I first saw valves, I made early valve systems and then got my first tra <laughs> transistor radio. <laughs> and uh, that took me into Photoshop version 2.1 and I stayed with Photoshop forever because it allowed me to manipulate imagery, allowed me to manipulate stills and then subsequently and now we have uh, Resolve 
any cinematographer who doesn't understand resolve is losing a large part of what we have to do. We, we do two things. We both expose, we control the lighting as part of that package on set. And the second thing is we should have control of our image in post. Yeah. The ability to go and sit with a timer. And only recently was I reminded of that on this lovely picture that's coming out next year called Going in Style with, well, shameless plug, Morgan Freeman, Michael Caine, and, and Alan Arkin. Shameless plug. That's awesome that you got to work with those guys. <laughs> it, was, it was an extraordinary experience. So we did this with Zach Braff last summer in New York. But six months later, I got to sit with a timer at, at Photocam uh, Costas, and he and I spent 100 or so hours going through the movie meticulously with Resolve, um, putting in shadows where I was unable to do it, taking things back, bringing things up, mm -hmm. tracking Morgan Freeman's face quite frequently because in contrast to Michael Caine, who was quite a white Englishman, <laughs> uh, there was less light that wound up in Morgan's face. And we were still getting the light, but he absorbed more of it. So we had to track him and bring him out occasionally to complement the frame and, and allow for the comedic possibilities, even though I thought the frames were great, yeah. Um, Zach said, mm, we, we need to see him a little better than that, so <laughs> we have to bring him out. A, a credit to the Alexa Raw system, absolutely painless being able to bring somebody up two stops if necessary without oh, wow. noise. It's spectacularly powerful. And, uh, you know, that's one of the big challenges I have with some of the other cameras out there, that they don't have that level of dynamic range. You can't go five stops down or five stops over and still bring it back to neutral. And that, for me, is the stamp of a good chipset. Yeah, well, like you always hear about in uh, uh, Mad Max Fury Road, how for the day for night stuff, they yeah. just underexposed everything, yeah. right? Yeah. It's yeah. insane, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. it goes against conventional wisdom, and yet it looks beautiful. Yeah. Well, those those are tools that the cinematographer should be responsible for, mm -hmm. uh, and right through to kissing the final print, you know, and that was, of course, on a feature, people respect that, and it, that was a wonderful thing about it other series that I did last year called The Last Ship, the uh, production supervisor didn't allow me to even sit with the color timer. I was never present really? for any of that. And, you know, Michael Bay's production, okay, fine, he has his look and everything. But really, the respect due should have allowed me to be there at those sessions. I should have been notified when they were there and so on. So I, I feel that's a system in this digital age which is losing touch with the realities of the importance of cinematographers and of course one of the problems is with everybody being able to see what you do there's no mystery anymore and the cinematographer is losing control of his ability to create his look and carry that through to the end it's so much easier now for somebody in post to say oh i think we'll make this brighter this happened oh, in yeah. the shannara chronicles they devastated it the editors got in there and the producers got in there and they really made uh, the color that we had done on set with a dit, I might add, doing from raw, making the look on set, it never made it past editorial and it certainly didn't make it into the final color. Ah. So, you know, these things, obviously we work for people, but at some point, uh, certainly in the old days when you were hired as a cinematographer, it was because they wanted your look and there was respect there and very seldom do you hear those kind of divisive situations where people were let go or, or people took over. I will let the person remain nameless, but I know a, a cinematographer who shot a feature for a director. The director then learned how to use Resolve and relit the whole thing in post without the cinematographer. And when the cinematographer saw it, they were, you know, not happy because <laughs> yeah. like yeah. every choice they made had been, I mean, like down to the point of tracking power windows and, yeah. you know, like in dolly shots, changing the way foreground and background oh, yeah. interacted oh, with yeah. one another. Absolutely. All of that's possible. And it's both a blessing and a curse. Let me ask you a little bit, I'm sure that we'll get a little bit more into your background, but I feel like your work has kind of a distinctive look, and I'm sure that, you know, you'll go work on a show that where there isn't a distinctive look, but even like, I was looking at the reel that you posted online, so maybe that's biased because it's the stuff you chose to 
put forward, but I've been watching your stuff for years. And I do think that there's a certain craftsmanship to it. There's a certain intentional use of overexposure in certain parts of the frame. There's always something interesting in foreground, middle ground, and background. There's like a full story happening. And I I just wonder, like, do you have a way that you define your own look? Or do you just want to dive in and give people what they ask for? Because obviously, after doing it as long as you have, you're just going to make a series of decisions based on your experience that are going to be your look. Well, starting out professional life, when I finally did get to shoot, I cut for a year. I shot documentary in South America for six months. Then I cut it. And on the strength of that, the network in Toronto gave me a cutting job. So I cut for almost two years with a six-plate steam back. Um, wow. Original video news film where there was no negative. Then when you made a cut. Oh, just shot on reversal? Yep. And oh, when dear. you made a cut. You couldn't put it back together. Ah. So you would always cut long and gradually inch in yeah. towards it. But that really Measure taught twice, me a lot about, about having to make a commitment to time and planning because everything was cut to size and timing. Um, I think the whole process of editorial is as important for a cinematographer to understand. It's, it's sort of vital that you do cut your own stuff, mm-hmm. at least to get it out of your system to a point where you say... No, I have to lose this. You can't fall in love with it. It doesn't advance the story, so we chop, it's gone, you know? Yeah. So my documentary experience, I did about 20 years out of Toronto, all over the world, 80 countries. It was fun. Uh, I don't think I could do it anymore, but, you know, <laughs> hauling that 200 pounds of stuff So you were around. traveling with, with a Steenbeck to those countries? No, 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 no. I, I just cut for two years for them, but they then gave me a camera job. Oh, I finally, oh. I finally got a camera job. I'm sorry, Mr. So for, for 20 years, I shot for them. And it was 16 mil, Ari. Um, I, I didn't have, I had an ACL Eclair. I never had an Arton. I would have liked an Arton. Mm-hmm. I was surrounded by them. Ab- arguably the best of the 16 mil cameras. It shot beautifully on your shoulder. I used to rent that on 24 when we need to go handheld. We'd rent, well, I suppose, what was for Penelope, but there was a 35 mil equivalent, yeah. the Arton because it just sat on your shoulder very well and had that lovely wooden handle and you could run <laughs> with it and it was it felt great on the shoulder, basically just sat there. But I was with a, an Arflex B, and well, I did have a BL for a while, dreadful 16 mil little box. Big and loud. Yeah, it, it didn't have a blimp. You're right, it was loud, 400 foot max. <laughs> the school had one, that's how I started with I don't know, that. a single sound guy who, who ever liked the BL. No. Uh, the BL35 is probably more what you're thinking of. Mm-hmm. You, you kind of, yeah, that thing was noisy. You had to be very careful. You use a lot of nose grease when you're putting it in through the gate. So just <laughs> like a little bit of fluid there. Um, it was more silent with that. Mag chatter, having to deal with all those things. Yeah, I had an SL1, and then I had an SL2, and I had a Super 16 gate for it, which had been in the bottom of the Mediterranean. I managed to get very cheaply out of London. <laughs> At the, <laughs> one of these technicians pulled one. I said, you, "Do you want this?" And I said, "Oh yeah, I want that." You know, you're like pulling fish, fish skeletons out of it. Well, it was it was a little crusty on the inside. You could tell <laughs> it had been in the bottom of the ocean for a <laughs> bit. <laughs> but that was my st- my workhorse, and that and two mags carried on the plane, and then you know, those bunch are great of film cameras. Back, and it was a good solid work horse camera, and uh, various zooms, ten to one hundred. Um, 9557, which was a, a nice short wide zoom. Uh, but you, you taught yourself the how to tell a story with a camera. If you're rolling continuously and it was something you couldn't control, you would say, okay, well, I, this is it feels like a master, and I can zoom in and get a little tighter on this, but now I got to flip over to the other side to quietly move around. And you keep rolling the whole time because you didn't want to sink because you didn't want it to attract. You were trying to do fly on the wall. And yeah, yeah. Some of my greatest moments were those kind of things where. There was real drama going on and tension in the room and people just ignored you and you just managed to get all the angles and so that you could cut it together. But the training as an editor helped because I would always go crazy if people didn't give me the cutaways at the right time yeah. and couldn't structure it. So carrying that on, um, that helped me a lot with 24. And I had done uh, one story in Northern Ireland the week after Bloody Sunday where we were driven we were blindfolded and driven around by the IRA and then taken to the back of a cub, a pub at night into the back room where the divisional head of the IRA was uh, there and we pulled his turtleneck sweater up over his face and we interviewed him. 
I was not shooting then. Uh, I was the sound guy on that. But it was, wow. the, that experience sort of helped me a lot when we're thinking about 24 and how do, how do people react under terrorist conditions. And, and of course, sadly, it's more the norm than the rarity nowadays. Um, and I don't think it's going to go away. Um, they're starting 24 up again, and I don't know whether there's quite the appetite for it. Mm -hmm. at, at the time, it was a fundamentally an educational tool to both excite and terrorize um, people around the world because we sold it extraordinarily widely around the world. People liked that palpable tension, but also they came away thinking about terrorism in a different way. Well, you know, before we even get into 24, I have a couple of stock questions that I would love to ask you that, sure. I, that I kind of ask everyone. And now that I sort of have an understanding of your background from your point of view, the big question that I ask everybody is, where do you come from? Do you come from lighting? Like when I hand you a script and you read a script, do you see it in terms of the way you're going to light it? Or do you see it in terms of composition? So in other words, are you creating an image and then finding the composition within that lit area? Or are you creating a composition? And I have a theory about you, but I want to hear your opinion of that. Well, I, I would, of course, trained in London. So I tend to lean towards the English tradition of a lighting cameraman. So I would first say that I'm, I'm affected by light first mm -hmm. and how you might position light to affect the tone of the story of the scene, augment, um, contrast, so on. And then the compositional part of it is not so high on my list because I feel that if I'm going to hire operators to compose and execute for me, then I don't feel that they're part of the team unless they're contributing. So I give them freedom to contribute. So that means... I primarily control the overall finished product, but I'm eager to seek a contribution from my operators about how they feel it should be. You know, I can nudge them to say, look, lead a little more here or follow this frame. Uh, but keeping the old adage from documentary days, follow the puck. Mm -hmm. It's about <laughs> what's important in the story uh, and making sure that you are positioning the audience to see what you want them to see at the time that you want them to see it. Light is obviously a major factor in that, but composition is sometimes equally as important. But I have less control over that than I do over the lighting. Of course, I share the lighting responsibility with my gaffer. Mm -hmm. And so that's a shared experience. In a normal feature environment, um, after being involved in prep, working with production designer, pre-formulating a plan, it all kind of hangs in the balance until you see the blocking, you see the read-through, you see the actors block it, and you're in a space provided by the production designer, augmented or, or taken from reality. Uh, and then it's your job to say, well, we're in a supermarket, guys. It has to feel like a supermarket, and there's only one way you light a supermarket. <laughs> Unless you're near the windows, you can tend to bring, you know, hard light in, and maybe it reaches the tellers in the front yeah. at their waist or at the teller machine, and you can cheat those kind of things. But generally, people I think are thrown by light, which is supernatural. Unless you're doing a fantasy, and you can get away with anything. So on this. Shinara series, we used a lot of xenons, old style xenons with oh, wow. mirrors and so on, and cut vigorous, narrow shafts of brilliant light blue <laughs> into spaces that were <laughs> not meant to have light, you know. And we just said, well, fuck it, you know, who cares? Yeah. It's like, it was great. And so I, I like that you can do that when you shift gears tonally about what the content of the story is, the genre of the story. Um, obviously, uh, horror story really thrives on not seeing everything in the frame at the same time. Mm -hmm. Always having a portion of the frame be dark. Uh, it makes it a better product if you're using harder light and so that you can always go back to the traditions of the 30s and 40s where everything was a 5K and a 10 for now and very aggressive cutting. 
so that you could force large chunks of the frame into darkness simply by putting a cutter in and it wouldn't go anywhere. Um, <laughs> a lot of what we're obliged to shoot in modern drama involves white rooms and they are the death knell to a cinematographer's <laughs> control of contrast. Yeah. So you're continually trying to say, well, I can't do a 180 in this room because I need to put black up on that wall. Otherwise, I have no contrast. And it becomes very bland and flat and boring. Not that bland and flat and boring doesn't have its moments. And certainly, comedy le leads you in that direction occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, in this movie last year, I had so much fun with Morgan Freeman's face, with Michael Caine's face, and Alan Arkin. I mean, there was just, and then I had Anne Margaret, bless her heart, to deal with. Oh, wow. Who was 73. And I got a lovely, lovely voicemail back from her. Um, I was in Kuwait for s reasons, <laughs> and, and <laughs> like I, got, you do. I didn't answer the phone, and so it went to voicemail, and she left this beautiful message saying how much she loved she, how she was lit in the movie. And it was really a question of saying, well, she's 73, and we have to be careful here, and so on. Um, I think in the end, there was a tiny bit of digital help given mm -hmm. uh, but there were whole scenes where there was none and it was all up to me so I felt pretty good about that uh, we're in the business as cinematographers of creating a safe haven for the actors uh, an environment within which they can perform they are assisted even though it's subtle by the tone of the light that they're performing in and I think sometimes you have to be careful that you don't broadly wash everything in a way that they don't get a sense of, oh my God, if I don't hit that light, my knife will not be seen, you know? <laughs> or, or this dagger in this compromising moment, and how do I hold it, and so on. And, and I like older actors because they often have had stage performance. They know how to rock into a key light because they feel it on their face. Yeah, yeah. And you really appreciate that with the old timers because they, they just have been there and they know they get it. Uh, so many performers, modern performers today, don't school themselves in those older crafts. And I think that's a shame because knowing how to help you by finding your light when I gave it to you, I actually I actually exploded on a guy in New Zealand um, because local Maori boy, lovely chap and a lovely actor, but he was a little bit out of, his, out of control of himself and he was on a horse. And I put a cross light on him to give him a nice, strong cross key, like 90 degree cross key. And he rode into this position and took the light and then for absolutely no reason, moved his horse forward a few more steps and went completely out of it because he was grandstanding the other actor and he wanted to be the one who was in the front of the frame. Oops. And I screamed at him. I said, don't you fucking do that again to me because <laughs> I put the light there for you for that moment and you have to be a cognizant of it and we're a partnership here. And when you do that to me, all bets are off. You, you went into darkness and I'm, it's nothing I can do about it. And I said, don't tell me you didn't know how to ride the horse because you backed right back into that market the end of the tape and, <laughs> and you totally had horse control. There was no question you knew what you were doing. But please, it's a deal between us. I give you light, you take it. If you don't want to take <laughs> it, that's your problem, but it's just gonna make us both look bad. And of course, it applies more to hard light than soft. Soft is a tricky thing because everyone's going to Kino's LED Kino based lighting now. And I've fallen in love with Quasar Sciences system of, of uh, with fluorescent tube structures put into Kino flow fixtures because they're core plus, they're light. You stick them anywhere and they yeah, come Yeah, Ilya was telling me about those. I, I haven't tried them out yet. They're, they're fantastic. They're, they're taking over. Many people make very sophisticated lighting that's LED based and they spend a lot of money Ari, for particularly with the sky panels and so on and they're RGB and that's wonderful and they have very good color temperature control, very high CRI but they're very heavy and they have a big ballast and at some point you say well the Quasar guy's approach is to replicate a tube as efficiently as you can, give it a very high CRI, make it color switchable and now their versions a variable color control from 2700 to 6K Kelvin, and put them in whatever you want. You stick them in a, in a fat boy that has six two-footers in it, it's basically a kind of a square. You add silk or your diffusion or you don't, you can do whatever you like. And then as long as you have some good Fresnels around to augment that, 
If you want a shop cut, there's nothing like a Fresnel, and or a Dado it cuts very mm-hmm. well. And Dado have a very fine light now, which is 90 watts of LED, very low power, maintained, very good color temperature, but that has a ballast. So there are other people coming to market with versions that don't have a ballast, they're a little cheaper. I personally think the best light out there if you're just starting out is a par, a rock and roll par. You can pick them up for nothing. Secondhand rock and roll shows, um, I think they're less than 50 bucks new. And there's wow. a, a par 38 bulb, par 64 bulb in it. And you can get a fire starter all the way through to a flood. And that's a lovely light because you take a narrow beam, one of those into any room and just hit the corner of the wall and you get beautiful refractive light. And as you pan it around the room, you can see a change in its quality. And then all you need if somebody you're lighting in this, they're not moving around a lot, you just bring in some negative fill and you're off to the races, you know. And the, the beauty of the modern cameras is you can see exactly what you're doing. You actually see exactly what you're doing. Okay, guys, can you change to 2700 Kelvin on the camera for me? Oh, okay. Now take it to 6000. Let me have a look at that, you know. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> now can we change the color on the LEDs? Well, flick those over. And ultimately, all of that will be on the palm of your hand and your laptop or your, your yeah. phone, rather. Yeah. You, you can control it personally. But right now, I have I have a board controller who runs around behind me with a with a laptop and does all of that. We have five or 600 lights that are under digital control. Because I'm, I'm a giant horror nerd, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about working with Mick Garris on Sleepwalkers. Mm-hmm. I think, to my knowledge, that's maybe the first horror movie that ever used CGI. That was, was, that, that was one of the first theatrical features you had shot, correct? Yes, I, I had done a couple before that, but we had done uh, Psycho 4, a yes. prequel together Mick Garris picked me up to do that mm-hmm. and it was wonderful to be based out of Toronto and then gradually more and more Americans would come up and they would hear about you and then they would ask you to go do things and uh, we went to Orlando to shoot that. wait a minute so this is crazy because I'm from Orlando Florida uh-huh so I was in high school when they were building Universal Studios Florida yes. and I remember driving down I-4 and seeing the Psycho House yes and being like holy shit there it is yeah. like movies are coming to Orlando for the longest time we we had this mistaken belief that Orlando was going to be like a mecca for for filmmaking and in fact Universal had basically funded a film school I went to two different film schools and the first one I went to they had funded ah. just to get a crew base just to have grips who knew yes. how to open up a C stand uh, that's still a problem to this day when you run out of crew it didn't occur to me that Psycho 4 was the one that was shot in Orlando. I, I, yeah, I, it was Psycho I, 4, and, and we were in a big new stage there. It was a beautiful yeah. stage, and we, we, they bought, they trucked the Psycho house in for us from storage oh, and wow. reassembled it in the stage. It was up there forever. We shot there. I shot a student film that uh, used Well, the we, we did use the exterior as well, but yeah. you remember, because you know it, it, the proximity to the rock concert or the, yeah. some cafe was ridiculously Hard close. Rock. The hard Rock was right there. Yeah, yeah. And it was very, very difficult to frame around that. Uh, this is pre-digital, so we couldn't do cropping and reframing and so on. So we had a bit of a struggle lighting it and everything. But yeah, that was it, and we set it on fire. <laughs> we set it on fire. <laughs> you kind of shot the first like big movie that got shot in Orlando oh, un- yeah. under that regime. I mean, other movies yeah. have been made there. Uh, that's that was crazy. wonderful. Um, it didn't. Even, I'm sorry. I, I should have known. It didn't even occur to me that four was the one that they had built that for. Yeah. It it got it's released on a compilation I think now it's actually not a bad movie no it's not um, I remember seeing it seeking it out at the time because yeah. I was, oh they got a couple of images on it in my reel because um, oh yeah because you got Anthony Perkins on there that's right but I mean I remember when it came out going out of my way to see it because it, I don't think it got like a humongous no, distribution. no 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 it didn't and it primarily was like a television movie yeah but we we did the right thing by it and so Mick got. Uh, sleepwalkers after that yeah and we shot that at Warner Brothers the old Warner Brothers Uh, although many things haven't changed the city square we had a hundred cats running through the city (laughs) square which was um, done by second unit DP and and director that I'm glad I didn't have to deal with the cats at that level oh dear but we had 50 or so at a time outside the house now long gone I think it was the old Walton house and um, we shot there, and then we shot on stages, of course, for a big build. It was the last time I used an arc, because the, the lighting crew, lovely guys I got 
from uh, Kovacs, um, Laszlo Kovacs team. Oh wow! Both Grip and Electric came to me in in tech because I didn't know anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know Laszlo? I didn't, but I went out to to meet him. He was shooting in Griffith Park, one doing night work, tro- towing some mm-hmm. vehicle in the night. And uh, he was just lovely. He said, Doc, take them all. You know, I don't have a movie coming up, but, you know, just use the boys. And so I got a great team. And they were really lovely, and they cracked up some old arcs for me. Nice. Um, white flame arcs to use in the interior of the house. It broke out into a garden at the back of the house, and we just needed more punch for daylight. So on Sleepwalkers, again, that was one of the first horror movies I remember that utilized CGI. Uh, today, you would just shoot a bunch of plates and yeah. figure it out later. But back then, I assume it was a lot more complicated. It was a it was a big deal. Mick wanted all these shots to be moving transitions. Well, the car would change, it changed shape, and it was great. We we used um, a track based system based on a peewee. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Pee Wee was dragged along by a tooth belt that was under motion control. Oh, wow. And so we could repeat it. And the head was a motion control head. I don't know whose head it was, but we basically put it through its move and then lock it and then would play back accurately after that. So we would just repeat the same identical repeat move. Repeat the same move. So we would do it with the first car, put the other car in and do it with the second car, and then they'd make the transition where wherever they wanted to have it creep into being changing its shape or and its color. And you also, there's like that one iconic shot where like the face turns into the cat face. Yes, and It's yes, kind of yes, a, yes. an early morph for a, for a movie. It was, it was. We did that on stage. It wasn't as successful. The background plates were, we shot out on Potrero Road in mm-hmm. Happy Valley. Um, it was supposed to be Virginia or somewhere. I forget where now. <laughs> Um, I always think botanists must watch movies and be like, that plant wouldn't be in Virginia. Ah, oh. I know. Well, they're so brazen about it. There's a series called Roadies on right now, and they shot downtown in the uh, Bonaventure Hotel mm-hmm. with the elevators on the outside. It's so distinctive. <laughs> it's so distinctive, and they're supposed to be in Denver. I feel like I could spend a whole day just asking you about 24, because 24, I feel strongly that 24, and specifically the cinematography in 24, kind of changed television. I first heard of 24 because I knew Krishna Rao. Do you know Krishna? Yeah. And Krishna told me he had been on, he had done A camera or B camera, I think, on the first ever episode. And I don't believe you shot the pilot or did you? I didn't shoot the pilot. Peter Levy shot the pilot with Stephen Hopkins. So, uh, but Krishna. uh, Peter didn't want to do the series, funnily enough. (laughs) But do you come on right after the pilot? Yeah, I did episode two. And we we had to reshoot some of episode one because of 9-11. Yeah. It went to air right after. Yeah, I remember, right. and I remember there being kind of like the thought of twenty four might not last a season because it's too close. Yeah, and yeah. and somehow it managed to actually kind of balance on the zeitgeist. But as a piece of cinematography, I feel like it, f- like so many shows, I I feel like it's hard to watch any kind of action television show or any kind of drama show, even like unless unless it's something that's like a courtroom drama. Mm. I feel like it steals a little bit from twenty four. Yeah. Well, we we were we were honored by being emulated substantially and in fact I think even in one of the early Bourne movies there's a guy standing very pronounced in a frame with with 24 jacket on oh really yeah and I I always thought that they kind of cribbed us a little bit and I'm glad to see that Greengrass is back and I'm excited to go see the new one to see whether they themselves have taken this genre in another direction mm-hmm. or enhanced it more but I my documentary background was a huge contributor we wanted Kiefer was a, is an intense actor and we wanted to be in his face the whole time. I was blessed with a really, really good camera operator, uh, Guy Skinner, who was A camera, and Jay Heron did B. And both of them contributed to that look, um, both in the way we approached the scenes. But the real person who set the tone for the movie was Stephen Hopkins, who did the pilot, and he did 12 of the first 24. And he was the one that said, we shoot every scene in its entirety, figure it out, Wherever you have to get the camera, go there. And we eventually made the the floor dolly, the rolling butt dollies. Yeah. Uh, key grip uh, at the time. I made the mistake of, go- of Googling and, butt dolly once. Yes. Because somebody was talking about one of them. And I was like, yeah, I shouldn't, I should never. <laughs> don't, d- don't Google butt dolly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, what do they call them? Anyhow, there's various versions yeah. of them out there. 
but we're still using them today. You know, once you go handheld, it's a really powerful tool to move, float around chairs. You can run after Kiefer into a room and he can sit at a table and you can, they, you squat down and the boys shove a butt dolly under you and, you and then you're free to roll around and keep the motion going Yeah, to contain the overs and so on. Well, why Guy was doing that on a 27 mil, Jay was back on a 420 on the three to one Panaflex lens, the, the widow maker, <laughs> on 30 feet of track, 40 feet back, all the way in at 420, getting the same size image on the face, and he would just kiss Guy's map box. So my whole time was watching the monitors and saying, guys, Guy, you gotta give him another inch. So Guy would go <laughs> give him another inch so that they can both continue to shoot. And they would cross axis together and float around, and we would shoot two takes that way in one direction. We'd flip the whole scene and shoot two takes in the other direction. And then the editors just fell into line with, with cutting, not worrying about the line at all. Yeah. And that was one of the biggest things that Stephen was adamant about, continuous takes, let the actors have the, the motion and the, the intent and the intensity. We don't break that up by, by cutting in and getting different angles. If you can be there and you get the moment, then fine. Otherwise, we're, it, that's the scene. How, how much of a purist was you? Like, if you're like, well, we just need an insert of this pencil on the table. Uh, we we were obliged sometimes because of story point. I mean, I ended up doing an insert which got us into trouble and also created the fan phone. It was a phone, and the mother of this boy had just shot her, his boy, his girlfriend, and she was lying in a pool of blood on the in their living room hallway, or just on the entrance, and the phone went off, and they wanted to see mother come up on the screen. It's like really the hammer at home, right? Yeah. Pool of blood, mother. And I got, I was just for some reason, I got assigned to shoot it because nobody <laughs> wants to do this insert. And we didn't take the number off and we couldn't because there was the only way to have it be dead and then suddenly come to life with this. So the number is on there. The next week, well, that was be a while. A few months later, we the shows go to air and it is, and the phone goes off and the prop guy and he said, hello? The guy said, is that, is that 24? And he said, yeah, but how'd you get this number? He oh said, no. Well, he said, it's it's on the show. Oh and, no. And he shut down, he immediately went to message boards, wrote about it, and it sort of went crazy. Oh and no. The phone wouldn't stop ringing. <laughs> Sprint said, hey, okay, we'll pick up the tab, but let's say it's a Sprint fan phone. So they said they got their money's worth out of that. Anyhow, over the course of a couple of years, it went to millions of calls, literally. And you could take the phone at lunchtime and switch it on, it would start vibrating instantly. And people were continuously calling. In fact, one girl, we flew her in because every waking moment she speed dialed the number. And she got through in the end three times and then we let us talk to Kiefer. And then she got the third time, we said, hey, we well, gotta bring this kid out. <laughs> so she came and spent a day on set. See kids, obsessive compulsive disorder can pay off. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, it was amazing. But but in a twenty minute period, I spoke to people on four continents. Wow! Because round the clock, people were watching the show and huge fans, and they knew about this number, so they would just dial from whatever country. Well, and also, like by then, you've off. got the internet, so I'm sure it's being yeah. shared on the internet everywhere. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and uh, so that was that was kind of fun. But we digress. Well, let me ask you. I mean, and I think this is somewhat more of a stock question. But I think that it leads to a really useful conversation. So somebody hands you a script and says, I want you to shoot this film or, you know, I want you to consider shooting this film. You read the script. What is the process by which you turn that into a shooting plan for you? How do you come up with the rules, long lens at this point in the story, wide lens on this part? Like, what's your process? Well, you're a collaborator. We work for the director. I think that's fundamental, and there are many people who come into this business wanting to grandstand themselves into a career as a cinematographer. The mm -hmm. reality is you work for somebody else. <laughs> yeah. You work for the project, and primarily you work for the director. And if you have simpatico with the director, then you evolve towards what your plan will be together. Uh, usually, I mean, Zach was the last good project that I did. I had proper prep. He's a shooter. He's an actor. He's a director. And... He got, has his own movie, and he goes out with his Alpha 7, and he shoots. And so I'm like right there saying, okay, do you, is this in our approach? Are we longer lenses? Are we anamorphic? Are we Panavision versus Ari? We tested everything, and we said, no, I like we all both like the look of the G-series anamorphics. So that's what we went with. 
And then gradually through the production designer, I had this fantastic uh, woman in New York called Anne Ross, who's a very famous production designer, has done, she did Lost in Translation. She does massive million dollar commercials all the time. And her struggle was getting down to our budget from $150 a square foot down to 50. Mm -hmm. But her taste was impeccable. So fundamentally, if you're making movies and you don't have good taste, you probably won't succeed. That's fundamental. So how you acquire taste is a broad classic arts education. You need to understand who the greats were that came before you, who the great painters were, the great sculptors. You need to be a fan of architecture, of architectural space, of lighting architecture, of placing people inside space that mood creates its own values for the telling of the story and how you augment that by is it darker, is it lighter, is it green, is it blue, is it yellow, is it gold? And a lot of those things come to you from costume and from the production designer who will work with you on a color palette and work with the director. And you all collectively dis discover what it might be. Mm -hmm. So you, the cinematographer, only have the responsibility of recording the final product technically so that it becomes the thing they put in the vault. That's what Warner Brothers wants, and you're charged with that responsibility. But what you actually photograph is a contribution of many creative people around and being directed by the director, because it's his movie. Mm -hmm. um, does that kind of help a little? Definitely, um, it, yeah, totally. Um, but it, like, if you're to be given a script before you've even talked to the director, when you're reading the script, are you seeing how you think it would be filmed? Like, When you go to talk to a director, do you pitch them like, here's my idea? And surely you must have worked with some directors who aren't as camera savvy as Zach Brown. Well, there are two. There are two ways to go. One is a gut reaction to the script, and if you're positive about it and you want to be involved in it, you probably have a good, strong sense of the way you'd like to see it. Yeah. But that can be definitely modified by discussions with what the aims of the director are, and then who you cast, and where their faces in in time and space. Mm -hmm. Are you going to need to help them get through with the lighting, or can you be aggressive about the lighting? Can you take them to the edge? A young female with a hard edge, raking with an extremely overexposed edge, which would not be appropriate for someone in their 90s. Uh -huh. You know, So all of those kind of things are there. Is this predominantly softly lit? There was an era in film where everything was soft, but I think there's a return to more harder light these days, as we're getting back for Nels and we've left the kind of soft washes away, the idea of cutting sharply and using hard light and negative fill is, is coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, there are an enormous number of extremely talented cinematographers shooting television these days. Probably more better shot video or, or imagery is shot for television than for most movies. The movies tend to be extravagant, yeah. transformer-like and we all know how that looks and how you get there and there's hundreds of giant lights and so on. But some of the small pictures like Joy was a beautiful 16 millimeter, totally doable by a small group of people. I had fun, Kuwait, I was in there because a friend of mine called me up, I'd known him for years. We met through an internet connection at NAB. He'd done business degree in Georgetown. He's a member of the royal family in Kuwait and you know he has money. But he has a production company and he's doing a 40-day shoot for a series which he's running on a on a, a streaming service called telly.com. Mm -hmm. And it's quite lovely. It's subtitled. And he had me go because he's, look, I'm spending too much money. I don't understand quite how we do this. He had a great director, good cinematographers, but the guys had two Alexas and a box of Cook Primes. That was it. Tiny amount of lighting. Mm -hmm. They were shooting on the street because available light, they could get away with it with the Alexa. They were shooting in people's homes. They didn't build any sets. They stole most of their locations. It's a great story about young uh, Kuwaitis dying and possibly it's linked to the invasion by Saddam uh, back in that period. Um, and the, all the issues there. And they, he cast two people, both with a very large following on the internet, three and a half million people for one of them and another half a million for the younger girl. She's only 14. And he's making that his approach. And his problem was he didn't have a first AD who understood how we do it in America or we do it in England, how modern filmmaking needs to be run like a military campaign, or otherwise stuff falls through the cracks yeah. and it can get expensive. But their final result was 
A plus film school for 40 days of shooting and they've got a series out of it. Nice. So okay, anybody can do this. It didn't cost them a lot of money to do this. No, you can It's can't. amazing. Yeah. And I'm excited by the fact that the internet now is spawning amazingly great material that people are just saying, look, we can do this. We just have to have a good story, fundamental. You gotta have a good story. And then you have to cast it well and get a good actor, a, a good director, and a good team behind you. But everybody in the world now can go online and learn this technology. It's oh, yeah. not a surprise. You just have to pick up a 5D or a Alpha 7 now, buy yourself a camera like that, and get some nice old primes, some old uh, contacts lenses or old Leicas, and you're in, you're in pig heaven. You can make that look as good as you're gonna get out of a Panifex package. It's amazing, yeah. and you can do it for nothing. Editorial, Apple gives you the product, the cut. Yeah, you know, and, and probably better now to be cutting on Premiere. Premiere I mean, Resolve, people are cutting it. You can edit in the free Resolve. Version you can of finish Resolve. your color completely. But you can even edit in Resolve now. They've they've put an yeah. NLE in there. Oh yeah, they have. But this is it's. There's no better time than say, I want to be a cinematographer. I want to make movies, because. You can see exactly what you're doing as you're doing it, and you can make changes. So you should practice a lot. It's like the actor sitting in front of a mirror, playing with facial expression, playing with lens angles, or not lens angles, but with putting up a light and seeing how it affects them. That's the important thing to do with a camera. What if I go to a very high ISO and I open the lens up wide and I shoot at night on the street? How does that look? Is there another way to make that look? You see it right there. We do push record. If you don't like it, you don't record it, <laughs> right? But that's that's anyone can train themselves. I went to film school, and yes, there are associations that you make at film schools. They'll be very helpful for you throughout your degree, your career. But once you get employed, you make those connections as well. So you don't have to go to film school to get to there. Everything is available online. There's thousands of sites that will teach you how to do anything you Google. Trust me, it's it's all there, and the kits are so cheap now. Yeah. You know, it, it, these guys, Zoom just came out with a little eight channel recorder. Fabulous for nine ninety nine. Wow. B&H has got it. That's a great place for us to leave it. Uh, Rodney Charters, I could talk to you all day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Before we go, uh, where can people find you online if, they're, if they want to see your work? Well, Instagram is about the only thing I do daily now. Um, which is you used to be Kiwi. quite quite the tw quite the Twitter guy. I I my daughter has to show me how, and I know you can link the two, but I oh. have to do one or the other. And I'm a picture based person, so I want to post the picture. I'm sorry, I was talking over you. What what is the Instagram? The Instagram is Rodney Kiwi. That's it. And so Rodney Kiwi at Earthlink.net will email me. Rodney Kiwi. There's a website, and there's also RodneyCharters.com, but I haven't touched that in ten years, so it's pretty ancient. <laughs> Cool. Thank you so much, Rodney. I, I can't thank you enough for talking to us. Okay, thanks. All right, so that was Rodney Charters, and hopefully there will one day be a part two of Rodney Charters because I just want to hang out with him again. Let's make it happen. So, uh, Ilya, who is our war story? Uh, war story uh, this week is Christian Seabolt, ASC. He is, uh, of course, a member of the American Society of Cinematographers. And if you've ever seen CSI between like 2008 and 2015, you've seen his work. He's done tons of television, multiple TV series, but I think maybe best known for CSI. Best known to me for Resident Evil Apocalypse. Resident Evil Apocalypse. That's right. That's also on yeah. his uh, his resume. I, I have a personal story about him that I, I discussed with him, I believe, off mic when we were interviewing him, but I'll run it past you anyway which is when I was getting ready to make the movie that would be released as Alien Raiders, not my title. When I was getting ready to make that, uh, you know, I was interviewing different DPs and DP reels were given to me and somebody gave me his reel and I watched it and it had Resident Evil Apocalypse on it. I was like, holy fuck, can we get this guy? And they were like, no. <laughs> no, but they, they gave you his reel anyway. Yeah, so yeah, we just gave you You're making this. a Warner Brothers film during a writer's strike and... You couldn't. You, yeah, so he, he was, was busy. Well, and I actually confirmed with him, yeah. like when uh, when we interviewed him, I told him I told him that story, and he, he was, was like, shooting CSI probably. He was like, "What? What? When was that?" I was like, "It was like December 2007." He was like, "Oh yeah, I couldn't have done that." <laughs> yeah. So, so here is Christian Seabolt's war story. And now war stories. <laughs> I had a project in the middle of the country somewhere that required us to shoot a very large interior of a military barracks. 
that is a space with beds that's, I don't know, 200 feet long with you know, hundreds of windows. And so we had a, a very large lighting package, you know, big, big, big truck with lots of HMIs and we had a big grip truck, we had everything to put lights into the windows. As we moved into these barracks, I said to the gaffer, you know, I don't see one light on. I see the lights out there, they're all out there, but what's going on? You know, you ran out of gas. He became pale and he was fidgeting around and I'm saying, just, just say it, you know, just, just explain it to me and then we'll fix it and then, you know, we'll shoot. And finally he said, you know, we have everything. We have, we have all the cables. We have, as you saw, the big lights, we have everything, but there's one adapter missing and I can't plug the lights in. I mean, this is not a practical joke or something, right? They said, no, can't turn the lights on. We can't come back. This is our day to shoot these scenes. And so I went to the key grip and I said, you have mirror boards on the truck. You have a 40 footer. You have mirror boards, you have reflector boards. You got all kind of, kinds of shiny stuff that reflects the sun, right? And I said, yeah, we got tons of them. And I said, it's a blue sky out there. The sun is out. The sun's going to be out for another six or seven hours. Pull all the mirror boards, pull all the reflector boards, anything that reflects light. And so they put them outside the windows, aimed them in. We did our scenes and, and they looked fantastic. Where I needed a little fill, we would just take one of the mirror boards and bounce them off a, a white board or something you know, for a little fill and it was contrasty and, and even the producers called me the next day when they saw the dailies. Man, how did you do that? That looked incredible. You know, all that hard light was so dramatic. If I had used our big HMIs, it would have looked like, I don't want to say boring, but like anybody else would light it. And now, short ends. All right, so next episode we'll have Christian Seabolt, who I would say is another fine piece of German engineering, not unlike Aeroflex. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe it. Uh, I can't. I, I, okay. I brought it back around. You, you did. You, you, brought, incorporated you, brought, you got Aries, 100 years, and German engineering, and Christian Seabolt. And, yeah. yeah. But he was I, raised in Munich, birthplace so, of, of Ari. That's so great. There, so there you go. So, so he, is, he is truly, yeah, he is. He's, he's, he's like, he's a, about as German as Ari. He is a pin registered man. <laughs> uh, oh, he's awesome. He, he's also received Emmy awards and ASC noms for all kinds of great stuff. So all awesome. Yeah. So, uh, short ends. so, uh, my short end is something that uh, as we are recording this, I cannot say out loud, hmm. but I know that it will not be released until after tomorrow when it will be formally announced Ooh, public yeah yeah, yeah. so secret. you're you're getting a little a little secret secret thing so 24 hours from now i will be at the premiere of a movie that i worked on as a co-producer whoa yes uh we shot it about a year ago mm. and it is it's called victor crowley and it is basically hatchet four uh the hatchet movies made by adam green mm. are a uh, horror series uh, that are kind of like a throwback to old school 1980s uh, slasher movies like Friday the 13th and uh, Halloween and stuff like that. And Adam uh, is, uh, he's the guy who presented 20 Seconds to Live, uh, but he brought me on as a co-producer on uh, Victor Crowley, which we shot about a year ago. And it was one of the most insanely short shoots I'd ever been on in my entire life. And I saw a cut of the film recently and I was like, I am... A, astonished at how great this thing came out given how little time uh it took to shoot and uh how shorthanded it felt like we were out in the woods in the middle of the night but it was a return to form for me and that we were literally just out in the woods middle of the night we were shooting at a ranch in santa clarita that has a uh, a swamp set mm -hmm. and uh it was uh old it's not just an old school throwback to old school slasher movies it's like old school, low budget indie filmmaking at its most fun for me. <laughs> I don't know about for Adam. Uh, I know that it was, uh, it was, it was a lot of work for him, but he really, uh, he really did a great job. But, I, but what I think is really cool about this, by the way, is that he's doing tomorrow night. There's a screening at the Arclight Hollywood that is, uh, supposed to be a 10th anniversary hatchet retrospective that he's going to be there with a bunch of stars of the original hatchet. And he's going to say to the audience, I have some scenes that you haven't seen from the original hatchet that we're going to show you. And then he's going to show them a sequel that has never been announced. 
Mm. So tomorrow he's totally doing a lemonade. Wow. On which whenever this gets released, you know, some, some time ago he, he, he's pulling a lemonade on his audience. And I think that is the coolest thing I've ever heard uh, a horror filmmaker do. Wow. So like Beyonce's lemonade of horror film. That is exactly the reference I was making. Yes. All right. So hatchet one, two, three, and four. You've probably seen all of them now. Of course I have. Yeah. So which is the best one? Oh man, you can't ask me that. Adam I might hear this. I have to ask you. <laughs> okay. You're going to have to say yours, I'm guessing. You have to say the fourth. Well, one. the one that I worked on is, is awesome. But here's okay, I'm going to give you a scene and it's in the third one. Oh, okay. But Victor Crowley, who's the bad guy, he, he's he's the boogeyman in these movies. Is played by a fella named Kane Hodder. And Kane Hodder was uh Jason Voorhees in I believe 5 Friday the 13th movies. Whoa. And he's he's a legend. Kane Hodder is a stunt man and he's a legend and he's in, in, especially in the horror world, he's horror royalty for sure. And, uh, um, in the third hatchet movie, one of the, uh, there, there's like the, this group of cops or whatever who are, who are, who are going through and trying to find him. Mm-hmm. One of them is played by a guy named Derek Mears. And in the most recent Friday, the 13th movie, which came out in 2009, Derek played Jason Voorhees. And so from the beginning of the movie, when he first shows up, I'm like, they better make the two Jasons fight. And oh boy, do they make the two Jasons fight. And it's the most satisfying. It's, it's like one it for a horror geek. And believe me, it, Adam's films are full of cool little Easter eggs like that for horror geeks all over the place. Tony Todd is a huge character. John Carl Beekler is a, is a recurring character. Mm-hmm. Um, Robert England is in one of them. Uh, uh, Josh Leonard from Blair Witch Project is in one is in the first one. Um, you know, like he's, he's feeling them, but I feel like that is in my opinion that that's my favorite, like in jokey moment that happens that is it's, it's very satisfying and having, I've personally worked with Derek and I guess now I can tell people I've personally worked with, with, uh, with Kane but like Derek, Derek is a friend of mine and you know, he's Derek is funny as hell. Like what people don't know about Derek, he's like six foot six and built like a brick shit house and all muscular and bald and always plays scary characters. He's in the new twin peaks as a big scary thug character. I, I'm looking at his IMDb yeah. right now and I see like thug and fighter yeah. and like, you know, all these people henchmen. And yeah. He was like <laughs> yeah. in, in the movie predators. He was, I think the bigger of the two predators. Mm-hmm. Like he's, that's what Derek does for a living for fun. Derek is an improv comedy dork. Whoa. He's got an improv comedy troupe in, in Hollywood called the resistance. That's a lot of fun to watch. So I know that I, I know having worked with, with Derek and just knowing Derek, that he was always game to do this, to, to do something like that. That would, that would be a lot of fun for fans. That's awesome. So anyway, I, I just think the reason I bring it up, you know, from a cinematography standpoint, uh, uh, the, uh, the movie looks great, but I think that it's an interesting way for independent filmmakers to kind of harness an audience and engage them. And Adam is taking his audience and giving them like, I can't wait tomorrow night to be in the room when they realize what they're there to see. Cause nobody knows they've kept it such a secret. Hmm. Nobody knows. And maybe I'll give you a full report later about how it went, but I well, feel like it's just going to be that moment when your favorite thing just became 25% more of that thing. Well, uh, they did a really good job of keeping it quiet because I'm on IMDb right now and there is no hatchet for in production. There's nothing. No, There's no, nothing. they've never mentioned it right now. If, and by the time this podcast goes live, I'm sure it'll say hatchet. For, it'll say Victor Crowley. It won't say hatchet for, yeah. but, um, by the time this goes live, it'll be known. But as of right now, it's untitled Adam green project. Yeah. Huh. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, actually right. It is untitled Adam green project is right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but 24 hours from now, hopefully they will, they will fix that. Cause once this plays for an audience, every, like they're going to want everybody to go online and start yakking their, their faces off about what they just saw. And hopefully they're going to love it. I think they're going to love it. I've seen a cut of it. I think it's really, it's really fun so and cool. The people who are showing up, these are, this is paying public. That's uh, that's they're not, it's a free screening free screening okay. at the arc light. So they're not going to get mad when they don't see whatever it is they think they're going to see. I think that they're no, I mean, I think it's going to be like jubilation when they, you when they it's see going to be like, they're losing their minds. They're going to just like lose their, they're just going to lose. Correct. Okay. And that's, that's my assumption. I'm, I'm really excited to see it with an audience. Cause, uh, again, having, having worked on it, having kind of 
seeing how it was put together and then seeing an edit of it and, and, it, and it being like, oh, wow, this like really holds together. It, you know, there's, there's that character in Shakespeare in Love played by Jeffrey Rush who's always like sure that the play is going to come together. And they're like, why do you think it's going to come together? And he's like, it's a mystery. And whenever I'm in, in, <laughs> I'm not saying that we had a tumultuous shoot. It wasn't tumultuous. It was just short. How many days? 11. Whoa. They had, they shot it in 11 days. Um, and then there was like a splinter unit that picked up a lot, a surprising number of scenes. Actually, hmm. I, what I think is interesting about this isn't just the fact that this film exists. It's that, uh, Adam is figuring out a way to treat a movie like a rock band hmm. and he's going to take this thing on tour now. Hmm. And, uh, and I think that that's, what's going to help it end up, you know, getting, getting a following and getting an audience and hopefully making enough money that he can go make a fifth one. Nice. My short end this week is actually the, I actually, I'm not even sure exactly what they're going to call it, but I think they're going to call it like the great anamorphic shootout or something Mm -hmm. like that. But it's essentially, it's a giant anamorphic lens test that is uh, put together uh, primarily by the people at ShareGrid, which is sort of like, uh, they like to call themselves the Airbnb of like equipment rentals. Like uh, if you, oh, interesting. you own something and you can, you can rent it out. They help facilitate that for you and help you with insurance and, and other things like that. But uh, they got a lot of attention some time ago with something they call the ultimate vintage cinema lens test. And uh, I helped participate with that and, and wrote some stuff up for them, but it's uh Uh, come around again now they're doing another big test that you can compare different lenses side by side and lots and lots and lots of different uh, lenses this time I think way more lenses than on the vintage lens test but um, anamorphics are sort of like a thing of mystery for a lot of people but these are uh, very expensive very exotic uh, pieces of glass used on you know tons of academy award-winning movies tons of you know uh, giant huge studio blockbusters anamorphic has basically been the gold standard for anyone who wasn't shooting like something like imax or 70 millimeter because it would pack in so much extra information and it would create all these sort of like arty effects that that people have fallen in love with so this is also something that's not live yet you can't uh, see it if you are listening to this before august 29th 2017 but by the time we release this it'll probably be out or probably right around that time but uh you can go to sharegrid.com and you can watch i'm gonna say hours of content tons of stuff if you are interested in lenses and you want to find out about uh very particular scientific aspects like uh myself uh, hot rod cameras we helped put together a team of people actually to sort of test each of the lenses before they even went into the test to make sure nice. that they were actually working correctly and what their sort of uh you know maximum contrast stop was and all sorts of other technical things but you'll be able to see a very pretty model shine a flashlight into the camera and do some other things and basically get an idea of sort of the where's that pretty model going that pretty model needs to see stuff that you can't see and it's right by the camera what a what a what a fetching lens flare she creates with her flashlight that is that's that's pretty much it i don't actually don't know if she's holding a a a flashlight for this they they might maybe it's a a gas lantern well they they actually had they had a someone operate the camera but they did some really clever stuff so it's really really highly repeatable so you're getting a, a basically the same sort of experience every single time it's a really nice way to do a test so that you can get a as much as possible sort of an apples to apples like hey lens a looks uh somewhat similar to lens b but totally different from lens c and when you look at all of them back to back to back you can really see the differences so if i didn't just lose all of our audience no at this point, no you, it's, this you're listening sense. to the cinematography podcast you if, should if be... you made it to this point in the show you must really like cinematography and you don't mind talking about glasses and you must love the sound of our voices <laughs> <laughs> I've never had anyone say that. So no, no, no one has said that to us once. I, I The thing I hear the most is, hey, really like your show. Uh, when will you make another one? But never have has anyone said like, whoa, you've sure got a voice for that. So. Well, hey, hello, sexy voice. <laughs> hello, Captain Sexy Throat. Actually, uh, that sounds way uh, that, dirty. <laughs> sexy Throat. <laughs> I'm leaving that in. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know, I, I kind of miss this episode just really took an interesting it did. turn. It did. <laughs> from German engineering to sexy throats. Um, so I kind of miss the old, like it seems like for a long time, in fact, you took me to a, to a screening that was called apples to apples back when we were still like, well, digital ever. We weren't even calling it digital. We were saying video back then, like will video ever be as good as film. And you took me to a shootout that I believe was the Sony F 900 versus the Panasonic Vericam versus 35 millimeter film. And they projected it on a big screen. And then, 
you know, like for a long time, Zakuda would do these grandiose shootout videos that would show like every fucking camera on earth shooting the same subject matter and people deciding what they liked about it. Or Mm -hmm. there was that one that I think you participated in years ago when the, it was the, uh, it was like the red one pre MX red one versus the GH one versus the, 5d mark ii when yeah when, that's right that's right we, like, did, we did that that yeah. thing that was uh boy that was shot with shot by byron shaw very talented byron's awesome and it made uh it made a big splash because people were not used to seeing what little cameras look like next to a you know yeah and i kind of missed that because we used to have like a kind of a, a and maybe it's been going on and i've just tuned out of it after a while but there was like i think that what happened was after a while, it got to a point where we everyone started to realize if you could color grade at all, you could shoot on an Arri Alexa or a Red One or a Red Epic or GH One, GH One, whatever, and you could grade them all to kind of look like they were in the same universe somehow. So it, was, mm-hmm. it became very hard, like to look at a Vimeo video and be like, "Oh yeah, I prefer X Y Z," because it's like it really just became about like, well, you should test any camera you're going to use for your purposes. And I think this is really interesting because this is how a lot of armchair quarterback uh, people on the internet discredit themselves because uh, they'll make these grandiose sweeping statements like, I'd never shoot on that camera. It's terrible. And then it's like, if you really feel that way, uh, you probably don't know very much about what it is you're doing because you can almost make any camera, any camera of a certain level. And if you know what you're doing when you go to shoot it i was involved in all those zakudo shootouts and stuff and the one where the the gh2 was like uh you know francis ford i remember this one yeah favorite and stuff uh i was the technical advisor to the to the panasonic gh team so i set up their camera and i got all their their stuff together and helped them basically make that happen but um it just immediately went to prove that you could have this tiny little camera and if you knew how to shoot it you knew how to grade you can make it look as good as anything else that was out there at the time yeah pixel vision's making a comeback baby pixel vision's never making a comeback big big pixel yeah. vision comeback coming your way <laughs> for those of you for those of you who don't know pixel vision was a fisher price camera that recorded to an audio cassette and it yeah. looked terrible and was made famous by the movie slacker because there's like a four minute sequence also in the movie nadja what yeah. <laughs> i don't know what nadja is it's a vampire movie that had peter fonda in it and i believe david lynch might have been one of the executive producers <laughs> oh, okay i i i'm I, sorry i missed that saw it in the theater motherfucker wow. anyway okay <laughs> wow okay mic drop there you just like i, yeah. I i've just you just i just out pixel visioned you whoa i i'm uh, it, in the pixel vision off i have just one i'm i'm speechless you, yeah. you just you just you just dropped it on me like a ton of you're products. welcome you're welcome pixel vision we love right. you. We'll have, we'll have you back whenever. So uh, thanks again to uh, our sponsors for the show, Hot Rod Cameras and Airy. For, Airy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Airy. Happy birthday, Airy. Happy birthday, Airy. 100 years of Airy. I hope we have another 500 years of Airy. Yeah, me too. Okay, so I think that about wraps us up for episode 14 of the Cinematography Podcast. Uh, before we go, Ilya, where can people find you online? They can find me in all the usual places, the Twitters, the Instagrams, the Facebooks. I'm at Ilya Friedman. I know it's a difficult name to spell, but it's not that hard. I think I'm the only one out there. And then uh, you can also find me at Hot Rod Cameras. Doesn't the Cinematography Podcast have a Twitter feed that's at Short Ends? That's true, although it hasn't been updated lately. But they can also find show notes and everything at camnoir.com. So that's really where to go. That is. That's that's really where I go to camnoir.com. Uh, you can find me at Neptune Salad on Twitter and also uh, Neptune Salad on uh, f- Facebook on Instagram because some douche canoe went in and stole Neptune salad. You can find me at Benjamin underscore rock on Instagram. <laughs> Not at douche canoe. <laughs> Not at douche canoe. Douche <laughs> underscore canoe. I don't know. I'm sure that somebody's got that. Someone's already got that. Yeah. Now, so, now uh, you're them, so. <laughs> Hey, uh, let's thank Kay Zalatrachi. Okay. Kay Zalatrachi who uh, did all the music for our show and does all the music for every episode. You can find him at music by And uh, not only does Kay's uh, compose awesome movie scores, which you should hire him for. Turns out Kay's also is an amazing color grader. True story. He's currently working on his second feature. That second feature 
Victor Crowley. You know, he's who got him the job. Me, I got him that job. <laughs> so we can finally say that we're, we're you've paid him back now for all the work that he did for the cinematography. Clearly, yeah. clearly. Uh, we also want to thank Mike Wilbanks of Lumos Pictures, who edited the episode. Thank you, Mike. Mike, you're awesome. Everybody go to Lumos Pictures and hire Mike. He is dependable, nice, hardworking, and one day we hope to meet him in person. Um, that might happen sooner than you think. Maybe. All right. So thank you very much for listening to the uh, Cinematography Podcast, and we'll see you in nine months. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thank you.